Well, a very warm welcome to November's edition of First Friday. My name is Tom, and I'm joined uh, in the studio with Stuart Reynolds. Are you well, Stuart? I'm very well, thank you. Good. And it feels like every time we meet, the world has changed, but it does seem like a lot has happened in our country politically. But also, since we last met, there has been a loss of a a great Christian hero, I think, a modern-day Christian hero. Do you want to tell us about this, Stuart? Yes, I just felt it was worthy of a respectful mention at the beginning of the podcast since uh, this is the first time we've had the opportunity to record a podcast since uh, Brother Andrew went to heaven at the end of September. He is, for me, a modern-day Christian hero. Of course, he's the founder of the ministry Open Doors, a ministry for persecuted Christ ones. I had the privilege back in 2004, me and my Helen had the privilege of hearing him preach in person when we were in Northern Ireland. He was an excellent preacher. I just wanted to share some quotes from Brother Andrew. The Bible is full of ordinary people who went to impossible places and did wondrous things simply because they decided to obey God. He also said, God may ask you to become part of the answer to your prayers. If that happens, rejoice, for then you will be participating in the greatest adventure imaginable. And then my favourite one, that's the excitement in obedience, finding out later what God had in mind. Mm. Just a reminder before we turn to today's topic, that next month's First Friday is going to be the last one. And so we would love to do a final Q&A session. It's one of the favourite things that me and Stuart have done uh, over these months. And is it a couple of years we've done First Friday, maybe? If you include Too Hot for Radio as well, definitely a number of years. Covered lots of different topics, but we'd love to have some questions to answer. So is there something on your mind that you would love us to discuss? Is there something happening in the world that you think uh, that a Christian perspective would be interesting to look at? And basically, we will collect all the different questions that we get. Maybe after today's topic, you'll have a few questions as well. Who knows? Send us an email to info at gnba.net. That's info at gnba.net. We'll collect those questions up. And for our final First Friday we will do our best to answer those questions, Lord willing. Our topic today, though, is one that has caused controversy for probably thousands of years. Basically, the question of women and the ministry opportunities that they should have uh, in the church. And so we are going to begin by uh, just talking a little bit about our backgrounds, where Stuart has come from, where I've come from. Then we'll maybe define the terms a little bit, and then we'll just open up the floor and we'll do what we usually do. So, Stuart, tell us... Disappear into it. (laughs) That might be right, yeah. (laughs) So, tell us, uh, Stuart, what background have you come from and what impact has that had on you in terms of this topic specifically? Well, let me actually start to answer that with a a little story about a pastor who was concerned over the response of his congregation generally to everything. And he said to his head deacon, I can't work the congregation out. I can't tell if it's because they're apathetic or, or they're just ignorant and... The head deacon said, I don't care and I don't know. <laughs> um, and I guess f- for me, for many years, that has been my response to this issue. I don't really know. And do I really care? So really, I've been a bit ambivalent. And I think that's probably the way I've been all my life. My church tradition would be a Wesleyan tradition, specifically the Church of the Nazarene. I grew up in, in a church denomination where the vast majority of of pastors were male. We did have a few deaconesses, and that was defined as a full-time call to ministry that was not preaching. Latterly, and I think right up to the present day, that role of deacon or deaconess has largely disappeared from the Church of the Nazarene. And so the, the pendulum's kind of swung the other way when we, we have a real influx in that denomination of female pastors. But when I was growing up, it was very much in the minority. There are one or two female pastors from my growing up days that I do remember. The unofficial mindset, I think, for many was, of course, we don't disagree with women in ministry as long as my pastor's not a female. Hmm. 
And so that's generally where I have been throughout the years I've known you when we have talked about this issue. I have sensed in my own understanding of these things that I can no longer defend what my personal experience has been on the basis of apathy and ignorance. I don't know and I don't really care. It is not a central plank to the gospel, but it is a scriptural issue which does exercise the attention and the passions of many and which does, however way you cut it, does have real practical consequences, whether it's women in ministry or not. I have to confess in my ambivalence that if you were to press me on it, I probably would have gone down the road as the New Testament teaching being culturally historical and that should be the application. But I am no longer think that that is a worthy defense because the Apostle Paul in particular, he did not make his claim to what he said about women in ministry on the basis of culture. He made his position on the basis of Scripture, mm. which trumps culture, and if it's a scriptural principle, is timeless. Yeah. And so it impacts us today. So I am not where I was. Interesting. For me, through my teenage, wasn't a Christian, got saved into a church plant that had one foot in the Salvation Army uh, and one a, a local Christian charity. And the history of the Salvation Army is that William Booth was the brawn, he was the strength, but the brains behind the Salvation Army was always Catherine Booth, who was apparently... Uh, very gifted in terms of speaking. She had read the Bible five times before she was seven years old or something like that. My understanding is then that from the earliest days of the Salvation Army, women were involved in, in every area of leadership. And so into this church that I got saved into, I think it was never really talked about because it was just presumed that women did just serve in every area. And I think this is one of the dangers. It's similar to what you were talking about, Stuart, in terms of whether people care or not. Because I can remember having discussions with people to talk about the passages in the Bible, particularly the qualifications for elders, which seem to imply that that would be men, a, you know, a husband of one wife, but also the specific prohibition in First Timothy 3, verse 12. And I, genuinely, I kid you not, there were people who'd said, uh, I didn't realise that was in the Bible. And so coming from, I think, upbringing is hugely part of it. Because if you've been brought up in a church where women do deserve in that way, I think you maybe just never question it. And so I have seen a lot in my early days as a Christian, the main argument seemed to be for women in ministry was gifting. This woman is clearly gifted. She's gifted to speak. She's gifted pastorally. You know, I can think back to one of the most pivotal and foundational preaches in my early Christian life was by a woman. I can remember her three points to this day. But as I came out of Bible college and had been steered towards well, I was given a book by Mark Driscoll and that kind of was a gateway. That's a whole discussion for another day. But opened up a whole world of writers from John Piper to R.C. Sproul to uh, Tim Keller to uh, Alistair Begg. And I started to realize that these were all men and uh, held to the Bible and taught the Bible in ways that I'd never really seen before. Expositional Bible teaching and believing that every word was inspired by God and also applicable today in some way. And so when I came back to these topics, I was really informed by a lot of those writers, but still very much feel that the Bible is quite clear on this. It's only in recent months as we've been talking that in a sense, you've maybe come more from an egalitarian position. I've come more from a complementarian position. And I think I've got some what I would now call gray areas, which we can maybe talk about later, but would still hold that elders in the church should be qualified men and the people doing the teaching in church should primarily be the elders. And if there is someone who is gifted who isn't an elder, you'd be looking for uh, men who are, you know, have a good understanding of Scripture. I believe that the role of preaching in a local congregation is restricted to men. So that's my stance. We have mentioned those two words, complementarian and egalitarian. Why don't we try and explain those a little bit and then we can go from there. So basically everything in this topic, everything we're going to say is controversial. So just putting that out there. 
to be complementarian is to understand that God has created men and women equal in terms of their value before him, but God has designed men and women differently. And so not only do we obviously have different body parts and different roles to play in parenting and stuff like that, but even within the church as well, God has designed men and women to uh, carry different functions. And so as Adam was formed first, uh, Eve was formed second, there is some sense of a hierarchy there in a marriage. The husband is called to lead and the wife is called to be a helpmate and support. And so they would see the foundational verses in Genesis all the way through the New Testament to mean that men and women are created equal before God, but have distinct roles within marriage and within the church. Egalitarian view would be that all distinctions between men and women in terms of roles in the church have been removed because of verses like in Galatians 3, where it says that there is no longer male nor female, slave nor free, Jew nor Gentile. And so God does not call men to lead in a way any different than women would be called to lead. Um, I think I want to say before we move on that I'm sure you're the same, Stuart. There are loads of people, not just local church leaders that I know, but also writers who I have a huge amount of respect for, who we do come to different conclusions. So this isn't a closed hand doctrinal truth. This isn't something where I would not visit a church or I'd, I'd be happy to preach at churches that would be egalitarian. I'd be happy to read authors who would come to a different conclusion. But you're absolutely right in saying it's not like eschatology or something like that, where you could have a different view of the end times and it not really impact your average Sunday. But if you're saying that 50% of your congregation would not be able to serve in certain ways in the church means that it's going to have a big impact. So it's not the most important doctrinal truth, but it's also not a second-hand issue. It's somewhere in the middle. Those phrases, particularly the complementarian thing, has become really controversial in recent years. And I do a, another podcast called Sermonize. And I've interviewed a number of people that are really wary of using the complementarian word because it's now associated with a kind of patriarchal, bullying Christian men who... See, see women as ultimately second-class citizens and not say anything, not do anything. Women can serve in the creche and they can serve tea and coffee and nothing else. And so I think, although I would say in terms of doctrinally, I would say I'm complementarian, I do feel some of that awkwardness about using the phrase. Unfortunately, I, don't, I can't think of a better word for it than that. I think your example there of being reluctant to use the word complementarian actually is a symptom of what the underlying problems are to these things. And that is because of what is being driven in the culture. Uh, And I think a lot of the strands to this particular issue of women in ministry are being culturally driven. We understand, Tom, whatever it is we're talking about, things like we've talked about in the past, about the integrity of the ministry, about the character of our leaders uh, and things like that, and even parenthood, we understand that the majority will always try and do the right thing. But there are always exceptions in every category, isn't there? Part of the reluctance is because of, of the way that some men have abused that we're supposed to be priests in our home in terms of the family, not bullies. Mm. and not little dictators. And we understand how in the past, in terms of women's role in the local church and a woman's place in the home, how that has been damaged. So we we understand that the abuses can happen, and so we're not suggesting that this is just black and white and it's always one way and never the other. By the same token, there, there, there are females who are not good examples of mothers, And there are females who are misbehaving in church in the very same way that there were females misbehaving in the likes of the Corinthian church, which caused Paul to be faced with the question that he was when he wrote in response to that. But I would say that this is part of our problem, that we are being culturally driven and not being scripturally directed. So, for example... The culture is making a hullabaloo and demands about marriage. Mm. 
And then what has changed about the marriage stroke LGBTQ debate is the demands that this has made on the church. We have this equality in the world in regard to marriage now. Why shouldn't we have it in the church? We've talked about that. And with this particular issue of women in ministry, we have the same argument. You know, back, uh, was it 2016 when uh, Hillary Clinton ran against Donald Trump for the President of the United States? The big issue for her and the big slogan was breaking the glass ceiling, the first female, potentially, American president. And we have seen testified to in society, this is an observation, not a commentary, so many glass ceilings being broken. We in the United Kingdom, we had briefly a third female prime minister, you know, yes. and that's been and gone since our, we last recorded our podcast. We now have a female prime minister is getting near to the norm for us in our country. We know it's no longer a big thing. Again, the argument being the same as the redefinition of marriage. Well, it's acceptable in the world, so why not the church? And I think this is what... Did you point back to the 1970s? Uh, I think you said I that, that time frame. I think that's when it really began to change because even in my, my own home denomination, as it was... You know, there was a place for women to preach or pastor if they wanted to, but it really didn't happen. It's really only in the last 20 years or so that it's really become, as I said, a bit of an influx. But that would be the other way. It's happening in the world, so it probably shouldn't, whatever the issue is, be happening in the church. The fact is, if you were to read Isaiah chapter 3, Isaiah 3 verse 4, I will make boys their officials... Mere children will govern them. And then verse, uh, the same chapter, Isaiah chapter 3 and verse 12. Youths oppress my people, women rule over them. Now, that was not meant as a sign of progressiveness. That was actually an announcement of God's judgment on a nation. When we just open the doors and give the keys away to anyone and everyone in every place over anything. I think that we need to get back to Scripture. I think that um, we need to look at these issues. They do have implications, but the underlying implication is not the issue in itself. It's how we, what we believe about the Scriptures. You cannot believe... In the inspiration of Scripture, what is it, Second Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is God-breathed. You cannot hold to that and then turn around and say that Paul was a chauvinist. We believe um, that, that Paul wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And when he didn't, like, for example, 1 Corinthians 7, when he was talking about marriage and singleness, he actually made that distinction. I, not the Lord, or the Lord, not I, when, you know, he was making a distinction but when it came to these issues in regard to the place of woman, he made no distinction and his appeal, his argument was not in regard to the culture. It was in regard to, to scripture. For example, just to jump in to First Timothy at the end of chapter 2 when he's talking about a woman's place in public worship. And again, his appeal is to scripture. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, when he's talking about propriety in worship, and in verse 16, he says, if anyone wants to be contentious about this, we have no other practice, nor do the churches of God. And so he's setting this down, not in particular reference to the Corinthian church, although that's the instance of him writing it, but not also to a time frame but he's saying this is the practice in all the churches on the basis of his appeal to Scripture, First Timothy, and here in First Corinthians, his appeal to the fact that this is the common practice in all the churches. And in First Corinthians 14, he actually gets, he knows he's going to have kickback in this. 
And so he says in verse 36, and we I know I'm jumping in at a lot of verses. If you've got a Bible in front of you, get a Bible, look, and you'll see the context. I'm just trying to give you the highlights and the conclusions. But he actually gets a, a bit sarcastic and he for those who would kick back. And he says, verse 36 of 1 Corinthians 14, Did the word of God originate with you? Or are you the only people it has reached? In other words, are you the, the originators of the law? Are you laws unto yourselves that you make it as you up as you go along because of just how, how convenient it is for you at the time or how popular or how cultural it is at the time? I think you're right. I think that was a useful distinction between culture uh, and scripture. And I also think the argument that Paul makes in First Timothy uh, chapter 2 and I think also into chapter 3 is not so much culture but creation, isn't it? He founds the difference between men and women Mm -hmm. and the roles that they have in the distinction between men and women and the creation of Adam first and Eve second. And I think one of the arguments that I'd been told earlier on in terms of more of an egalitarian approach is that gender roles only happened after the fall. Adam and Eve are created equal and no distinction between their roles or any leadership responsibility. It's only after the fall you have this fighting for power and kind of the the man, Adam, taking control. Uh, But I don't think that's where the Apostle Paul starts. Paul does mention in 1 Timothy chapter 3 about uh, for it was Eve who was deceived. And that is part of his rationale. But I think we also recognise in the fall that Adam sinned as well. He sinned in not taking the responsibility that he was meant to take in terms of leading his family. And so I don't think the gender roles happened at at the fall. I think they were part of creation. And I, I have always wondered about the culture. I've looked into that before because while I was in my very short egalitarian phrase, I would have been the same as you and said, it seems that these verses are cultural. But when I've looked into it, there's really no consensus with the commentaries to say that women in Ephesus, I think was where he was writing to, uh, were particularly, yeah, basically weren't educated to a level where they would be able to preach in church. And so today, you know, women are as educated as, as men. So those rules don't apply. I couldn't find any consensus with that. One of the other arguments I've heard, which I always think is quite interesting, is people will say, well, women don't have to wear head coverings anymore. So... That was cultural, and so it must be that um, First Timothy is cultural as well. I really like my friend uh, Gav, who uh, likes to take the Bible very seriously. He will just, because of that, he'll just go, well, maybe women need to wear head coverings then. Instead of going, well, let's go back to the Scriptures and let's ask the question again, should women wear head covering? I'm not, that's not our topic today. I understand that's maybe even more controversial than women in leadership. But that's not a good argument, is it, that this verse here, We don't really obey that in the way that maybe we should or maybe we shouldn't. So that means we should let this one go as well. That is the argument in Scripture that I think if we're not careful, we end up having to endorse homosexual practices. Surely if we say, oh, well, that must be cultural. If we're saying that it's cultural that um, women weren't able to, to be elders or preach in church, well, then I can say Romans chapter one is cultural. I think what what you see is right. The road that says that this is cultural I think it is just, that's just far too simplistic. There's nothing wrong with being simple and and looking for a simple solution. There's a lot wrong with just being simplistic just because it gets us out of a tight spot. It might have been more convenient to us had Paul not made the application to Scripture in 1 Timothy, but he did. And so to me, that stands over and and we understand that the Scripture's are also a commentary. The best commentary on the scriptures are the scriptures themselves. What we have to understand, you you refer to headship there. Uh, Is that 1 Corinthians 11 when he's talking about Mm. about headship? And the whole point of that, yes, there is a cultural application, but there was a deeper principle there. When the scriptures talk about women in these terms, in no way, for example, when it came to the headship issue, was that meant to demean a woman? It was actually meant to preserve a woman's dignity, that that she wasn't being seductive Mm. and was not being a loose woman in how she dressed and behaved. It was preserving a woman's dignity. And it was actually saying that a woman in her own right, not just a married woman, that the church was a safe place for her to be a woman, to cover her head and to, to, to preserve her own dignity and not to be ogled by lustful men. But you see, 
you know, you made the reference Galatians 3, 28. There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. Come on. Now, I want to be as open as this as, as I can, but, but we have to handle the Scriptures properly, and we have to be growing up about these things. That is about salvation. It is not about service. And actually, you know, you went back to, and I've never heard that argument before right. about the gender roles after the fall. Is that what you mm. say? Well, there's a wonderful Greek word for that. <laughs> and I know I'm not as respectful as you are, but it's, been a it's while. baloney. You know, it's, it's, it's there at the end of, 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 of Genesis chapter 2 that woman was made as a helper to complement and complete, not compete. But interestingly enough, let me take you to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16. This is part of God's decree of the consequences and the punishments for the fall. And to the woman he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Now, I just wish you could see this podcast because... Tom has taken his shirt off here. You'll be glad to know he's got another shirt underneath, but that means he's really, I think, ready for a bit of a fight here. Uh, so, but it says it's there, warm in here. Yes, you're, you're not half. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. The significant word there is desire, and it's the same Hebrew word that's used in the next chapter, Genesis 4, verse 7. Sin is crouching at your door and it desires to have you. This is not the desire of affection. This is a desire to compete with and to control and to overcome. And here's where the conflict comes. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. This this uh, competition between male and female, we talk about the battle of the sexes, don't we? Who's the best? Anything you can do, I can do better. Remember that song from the musicals? And I would say that how perhaps some are re reacting to this conversation we're trying to have at this point, if they're getting defensive and they're wanting to turn us off because they've not heard how we're even going to finish, even though we don't know how we're going to finish. <laughs> but that is an example, Tom, of this fleshly carnal desire to compete and be recognized and be tops that is a consequence of the fall. This defensiveness, particularly in females, because they've been told, as they perceive, that they can't. But the fact is, Scripture makes a prohibition, not when it comes to salvation, certainly not when it comes to, to dignity, but when it comes to service and when it comes to to responsibility. I would ask a question. For me, the scriptures clearly teach, and this is how far I have moved, that male headship, obviously in the home, but in the church, is best practice. That's a phrase we use from the world. Best practice, right? Let me ask you a question. It is the best practice. I believe that's what the scriptures teach. But is it the only ever practice? What happens when the men in the local church will not stand up and be the men in the local church? Not the bullies, but the fact is the biggest problem in the United Kingdom is the same as the biggest problem in the British church. Men. Men who are still little boys in growing up bodies. So what happens to the local church when the men will not be the men? The reality is, and this is where it begins to get messy, not because women feel defensive or whatever and, and men feel that they can just throw their weight about. For me, this is where it gets to be messy because like you talked about that woman preacher who you remember her sermon, you know, Probably some of the best pastors I have known, although they be few, have been females. Don't tell me how that works out theologically or biblically, but it's there. It's a reality. What happens when the men will not step up? Do we just close the local church? As a matter of fact, how many local churches 
in the United Kingdom, and not even in regard to preaching, but just all the other functions, how many of the local churches in the United Kingdom today would still not be open if it were not for the women in those local churches? Yeah, it's a, it's a really difficult and messy question. I think you're absolutely right. In one sense, it's not it's not where you want to start because you could justifiably say, actually, it doesn't matter about the day-to-day situations you can think of. What's important is what the Bible says. Do you know what I mean? Because so, you can get into that with anything. You could say, well, my understanding of divorce is this. No one is to get divorced. If you're married once, that's you married for life uh, unless someone commits adultery. And then you can always think to that situation. Yeah, but there was this situation number of years ago where and you go into all the details and you just think wow that really complicates it that seems like the person although it hasn't got biblical grounds it seems that everything within you seems to say that's right and so i would want to start by saying uh, we both are saying the bible says and says clearly in first timothy 3 verse 12 i do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man rather uh, she is to remain quiet and so if you have a church where women are serving and uh, using the Bible as their basis, I guess my question would be, how do they do that? How do you, how do you stand up on a Sunday morning and say, so we're going to, I'm going to preach today from the Bible. I believe that the Bible is the word of God. I believe that the Bible is clear in what it teaches, but you aren't willing to bow to what the Bible says. The hardest example maybe would be of something like missionaries. I remember hearing a story of two missionary women going out to uh, a culture. The gospel had never been preached there as far as they were aware. And um, as they start to communicate over months, uh, talking to people, and again, I would see that as a role absolutely within the grounds that women can serve. I think I don't see anything in the Bible that says women can't be missionaries. In fact, I think the Bible specifically says we're all called to be witnesses. But anyway, I heard this story that they went out to this kind of tribe in some far away remote lands and led a few people to Christ and then said, we need to start a church. And one of you men needs to lead the church. And again, is that ideal? No, because the qualifications for elders is that you not be a new believer. And so it's not ideal. But if you're going to hold to what the Bible says, I, I guess for me, it just it seems to be on shaky ground to say, because we haven't got the right setup here. You could say the same, couldn't you, for someone who's let's say you've got a pastor who committed adultery and um, cheated on his wife and then has traveled to another church to get away from the shame of it goes to this new church but there's no pastor and they all just say look please can you just do it you don't just lax the rules because the the situation there seems to uh, that it would fit because once you start there on shaky ground i don't know how you hold the to the authority of scripture now that doesn't mean it isn't messy and i think it is just the same as we can all think both you and i can think of some teachers that well they seem like they're false teachers God sometimes works in spite of them. I think it would be the same with this, that where women have stepped outside the bounds of what is scripturally permissible, maybe God has moved in spite uh, of them through his grace. But I think it's very dangerous to say, uh, well, because there are no men, then the, the women need to serve. Yes, I mean, interestingly, you mentioned missionaries there. Over half of all missionaries throughout history, have been women, many of them single. John Wesley, for his part, he began uh, by saying that uh, there was no place for women preachers in, in, in Methodism. When it came to his comments on the likes of the admonitions in 1 Corinthians 14 that we've referenced, he said that... Uh, Women should be quiet, and he says, unless they are under an extraordinary impulse of the Spirit. And then he, I don't know necessarily if I would go along with that, because I think that's open to abuse, but mind you, males can abuse that Mm. by what they testify to. He also saw a distinction between a woman preaching in a pulpit and a a woman going to a prison cell to speak. And he had to wrestle with the differences between a woman exhorting or testifying or preaching. So, for example, you, John MacArthur's church a few years ago, Joni Erickson Tada, she spoke. Was it preaching? I don't know. Some people might have taken it as preaching, but it, I think they would have said it, it, it was testifying. 
Mm. Uh, when I was growing up in Glasgow, I used to date a girl who was in the Brethren Church and uh, used to go along to her church on a Sunday night. You know, women were not allowed to speak. You know, my mother would go around some churches. She was a, a she she was a gospel singer, and I used to go around with her. And depending on what church she was in, she could sing from a pulpit, but she couldn't preach. I mean, John Piper goes so far as to say he doesn't think that women should be postmen because they shouldn't deliver news, they shouldn't deliver things to men. And I think that kind of stuff you look at and go, I see nothing in the Bible that implies that. I think women should be encouraged to be involved in any area of ministry except what is explicitly forbid, forbode in Scripture. I think we're in a time of real change at the moment. And obviously, the reason we decided to to cover this topic was because we'd been specifically asked, because we know it's such a volatile issue. And again, it's not central to the gospel, but also we, uh, you know, if someone asks us to cover a topic, we, we want to do it. But I also think it's good to talk about it now because there is a, a shift within Christianity of churches that have been historically down the line on on this issue are starting to see change. So, for example, NFI, the New Frontiers Church, founded by Terry Burgo, they have always been a very, I think they would see themselves as charismatic, complementarian, Calvinist. I think there was the three Cs. But they now, uh, a lot of the uh, NFI churches, are open to women preaching on a Sunday morning. And the distinction that they find is... um, to teach and to preach is different than to preach with authority. You go back to the verse in 1 Timothy 3.12, do you read this as two things or one thing? I do not permit a woman to teach, one, or exercise authority, two, over a man, rather she is to remain silent. That's often the way it's been taken historically. So there are two things. You're not able to teach and you're not able to exercise authority. So you shouldn't preach in church and you shouldn't be an elder. Nowadays, a lot of people and a lot of commentaries would see this as one thing. In fact, the NIV, the Zondervan Study Bible, would take this as well. I do not permit a woman to have teaching authority over a man. They would take that as one thing, not not two separate things. So the argument goes then, a woman can preach as long as it's under the teaching authority of the elders of the church. I think that's the way NFI have gone. I think a number of other churches seem to be uh, taking that stance as well. So it means that there is a there's a lot of discussion going on at the moment. I've read various books. I read a book by... Tim Keller's wife. Uh, I've read a a book by a guy called John Dixon called Hear Her Voice because he would see his teaching authority uh, as different than just teaching and he would use lots of examples where the Bible, the New Testament seems to imply that all Christians are meant to teach each other. You see it through all the the epistles, that teaching one another, admonishing one another. Another example would be that a lot of people today would see these verses in 1 Timothy as only in regards to the local church. So that would mean, Paul is saying, I do not permit women in your local church to teach the congregation there and exercise authority over them. So that would open up the possibility that women could um, preach at conferences with mixed congregations and things like that. And so I feel like we're in a real shift at the moment. I was looking at um, YouTube a couple of days ago and I saw the Gospel Coalition have got a conference that just has gone on and Rebecca McLaughlin, who's written a couple of apologetics books, was there doing a talk. I was watching Keswick earlier this year, and there was uh, a number of breakout seminars that were uh, all led by women. And um, I think in the past, Keswick would have, wouldn't have done that. I think that's a newer thing. And so I feel like right now, there's almost a pushback against the extreme complementarian view that is maybe opening up these areas that are just really interesting to talk about. And I and I think in years gone by, it just would have been like, no, if you're complementarian, it's just no to everything in in regards to that. And I think because of that, we haven't we haven't encouraged women in ministry. We haven't um, encouraged them to go for theological training. We haven't encouraged them to share their gifts because of fear that they would take it too far maybe and so i think all this just is uh, opens up a but, whole but as, as wasn't that the whole point of what paul was being asked to respond to in first corinthians because the women in their newfound freedom in christ were taking it too far and becoming unruly that is part of the cultural and historical context to that whole issue to be wanting to usurp male authority but would you uh, admit that 
many denominations over the years have restricted women, been overly protective of making sure that they don't become elders or preach to mean that they're not encouraged in other areas. Yes, but, but what I would say now, and I grew up with that, but I think what, what rules now is if a man can and does, why can't a woman? That is the world. I think that we've gone, and we talk about the pendulum effect, that's human behaviour and experience, in responding and seeking to correct one extreme, we, go the other we, extreme. Fight, we, we, we find ourselves... Uh, up against another extreme. I mean, if you look at the world now, you've got women's football, you've got women playing rugby. If a man can and does, why can't a woman do it? You know, and, and, and we're seeing that. And, and, and I don't know if that's all right. What I'm saying, it's there. But we are now under pressure in the church to accommodate all these things. And I know I want to make maybe make some comments that are comments and observations And our questions, I'm not giving any answers because maybe I don't know the answers, but maybe the answer will be in the question. You know, people will go back to the Old Testament and they'll say, but Deborah was a judge. Well, if you go back to Judges chapter 4, you'll see that even even Deborah um, acknowledged the, the domain of the man when it came to fighting a battle and conquering in the battle. Judges chapter 4, and, and, and she called Barak to come and lead the army, and he wouldn't come. And he is typical of the man today, say, well, I'll only do it if Deborah does it. You know, what a wimp. You know, uh, and also, just because a person, whether it be male or female, because they testify to a call to ministry, why should it be presumed or expected that that should include preaching. Who has set that norm of expectation? But it's this idea, Beth Moore would say, along with some other women in in her position, she would say, I am called and I feel compelled. When is that ever a reason? Let me give you an example. 1 Samuel 13 and verse 12, this is Saul talking because he didn't want to wait on Samuel to come you know, to offer the sacrifices before they went into battle. And he says this, uh, I thought now the Philistines will come down against me and I've not sought the Lord's favor. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. That, an inward compulsion of the heart is just not enough, Tom. For someone to say, I feel called, that their call has to be tested, it has to be confirmed, and affirmed by by the church, at least the local church to which they're affiliated. But just to say that we feel compelled, I mean, even though we're saved, I still go along with Jeremiah in regard to my own heart, that the heart is deceitful above all things. Who can understand it? I would never dare to presume that I can understand the motives of my own heart. But just because I might feel compelled to do something doesn't mean that it's right. I want to just insert another question to you before I I, I make my final comments, if that's all right. The one thing that in my study for today that I have not been able to find, and so I have not any conclusion over, is that in these prohibitions or apparent prohibitions, it is implied, we we all know that the immediate context is, is public worship, and we get that, but also it's implied that it's the overflow as well or the backflow of the home and a husband and wife. What do you say to the single female who is not under the headship of a husband and who historically, you talked about missionaries, you know, I don't think, that Mary Slessor, um, she was a very effective Scottish Presbyterian missionary, Mary Slessor, and uh, I don't know if she ever married, but some of the most effective women of God have been single mm. women. And, and, you know, I can't find any, any counsel or comfort in regard to these matters. I can see how it all fits for a married woman better than I can for a single woman. Mm. 
Yeah, I think there's been a very unhelpful, again, maybe it's the extreme complementarian view, which would say that all women should basically submit to all men. And I think that is very unhelpful, and I think it is very unbiblical and not true. Uh, I would agree what you're alluding to there is that men are to humbly and servant-heartedly lead in the home. Uh, and so if you have a woman who isn't married, then she is not under the authority of the husbands or the men in that church generally. But I do think to be a member of a church is to be under the authority of the elders. And so if you're under the authority of the elders and elders are qualified men, well, then there, do you know what I mean? There is, I don't think a single woman could say, because I'm not married, I'm not under the authority of the elders. And the elders are described as shepherds, aren't they? And I do think one of the reasons, again, is not explicitly stated in Scripture, but I do think when you think of what shepherds do, the role of a shepherd is quite hard, but it's about protecting the flock, isn't it? It's about going out and getting rid of uh, wolves and, and, and any animal that could attack the sheep. And when I think about being an elder, I remember one of the hardest situations I was involved in. There was a guy from the community who'd come in who was basically a paedophile and had lied about his age and started to date one of the girls. We weren't really aware of this at first in the church. When it came to our attention, uh, me and my brother, who was the, the pastor of the church, went and uh, looked into the story and found that this guy had been in prison before um, for, yeah, for, for sexual assault and um, sleeping with girls underage. And so we went down into the city centre of Manchester and was staying at a homeless shelter and we confronted him about this. Now, it might sound highly sexist to say it but I was really glad that it was me and my brother that went and did that do you know what I mean the thought of my wife going down and having to confront this guy being a, uh, a, an elder is not just preaching and you know what I mean not just saying goodbye to people at the door of church your role is to protect the congregation and I think in a lot of ways today as it probably was back in those days it's a hard task and actually I do think calls for something of a male role but how many Tom and I'm not being flippant you, oh, you and your guy. brother stepped up. I know I could take you to churches where the men hide behind the woman and they would say, look like, like Barak did hide behind Deborah in Judges chapter 4 and say, well, will you go? It'd be better if you went. You know, I, I know men. I know men who've done that when it comes to church issues. And so you, you, the example you cited there is absolutely right, but you both stepped up there. What do we do when men don't? Yeah, and I think you, it's been clear from this podcast that men have got a lot to answer for, haven't they? It is the sin of Adam still today, isn't it, that men are not willing to take the responsibility to lead. You know, it's funny because my wife is more complementary than I am. And she always says, look, I've got, I've got it easy compared to you. Like, she says, you know, I've got my responsibilities, but you're going to have to answer in part for the way you've led our family. And where you've been an elder, you're going to have to answer for where you've led in a church. I'm like, oh, yeah, great. You you sometimes forget that. We need to remind people who are in a privileged position of leading in churches that it is a high calling. It's uh, You've mentioned so many times that it's the greatest job in the world, but it's we shouldn't be taken lightly. Do you know what I mean? The idea that you're going to be judged more harshly for the way that you have led and stewarded and cared and taught and protected a congregation, that's a serious weight of responsibility. Yes, and then trying to bring some maybe more balanced perspective in the very negative things I've said about men and primarily men in the church. Perhaps some men in the church, some men have just wimped out, but there are other men who would do better at doing the right thing if their wives were more supportive and cooperative. There are men who are being let down by their wives in this regard. I think it's important to say that Mm. let me put something else to you this is an observation that I've heard from Justin Peters along with other reformed Christ ones and he would suggest maybe he would even go as far as contending that Protestant evangelical churches and denominations which from and he traces it back to the 1950s started ordaining women have ultimately drifted to embrace the LGBTQ plus agenda. I fear he may be right. And and as soon as he said that, you know, we, we, we never would have said 
that we would ever be at this place when we're having these conversations that we're having about LGBTQ and all the rest of it being embraced and endorsed by real historically and traditionally sound parts of the church. But but look is look at what, what is happening and and. Justin Peters, along with other reform ones, we, 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 he would he would actually say you can trace it. I think we as a church in the UK need to do better at encouraging and equipping Christian women to pursue ministry, loving the Bible, studying the Bible, doing theology, uh, doing all those things, looking for opportunities to bet, be better witnesses and evangelists and teachers of God's word, as long as that is within the right context the right situation. I think that I have been guilty in the past of restricting roles for women out of fear that they it would step beyond the bounds of what the Bible says. And I think we've got to be able to hold the tension and not restrict roles simply because we think one day that might lead to this. I think we've got to acknowledge that having a view like this, not only is it uh, seen as very unacceptable in today's culture, as you said, but it does leave some grey areas. And I'm willing to admit and to have to kind of live with the tension of these issues. Here are some grey areas for me. First, women teaching children. I, I know very few people who would be complimentary and who would say that women can't be involved in leading Sunday school. But that is a grey area, I think, particularly mixed congregations of boys and girls. At what age is that unacceptable? Mm-hmm. Lots of churches I know of would say, oh, yeah, we're complementary, but actually you've got 18, 19-year-old boys in, in, you know, in the older youth group on a Tuesday evening, still being taught by women, is that acceptable? Is it not? What is the cutoff? Um, when do boys become men? Another grey area is whether women can lead services. I know pastors who would say that they wouldn't allow women to preach at a church, but they would allow women to lead the services. I know other ministers that would say, no, even to lead the service would be a teaching capacity. I think I would tend to think that women can lead services but can't actually do the preach from scripture. Another grey area would be women preaching at conferences, as I've already alluded to. I think that's becoming far more commonplace in these larger conferences from Gospel Coalition to Keswick to wherever. Conferences that have always generally been very complementarian, I think are starting to see, well, actually, maybe there's a way these conferences are not a local congregation. And so maybe the prohibition from First Timothy chapter 3 is not restricted of women preaching at mixed conferences, not just women's conference specifically. And then finally, an interesting one, grey area for me, is women preaching on radio. Because for me, and this is where I'll finish, I still, in my study, don't know whether to teach and exercise authority whether that is one thing or two things. I've read people on both sides, proper brainy Bible scholars who know so much more than me. I still come down to the fact I don't know. While I still don't know whether that's two things or one, there will be some grey areas that I just have to live with. I just want to give some scripture references for homework or more uh, deeper thinking and even for if people do want to We'll need to do it very quickly before we record our next podcast, but for any questions or comments uh, for December's podcast. But there is there is clear scriptural principle for women teaching, for example, just to date you to Titus chapter 2. There is also scriptural precedent for God making allowances. For example, in the Old Testament, in Ezra chapter 3 and verse 8 and then chapter 8 verses 15 and following, this was when the people were beginning to return from exile and there wasn't enough priests. And so from my understanding in Ezra chapter 3, the age limit was dropped to the age of 20. Um, and then in Second Chronicles chapter 30, there's a, a really interesting record there on the basis of genuine heart intention, not compulsion. But uh, the people were gathering back to celebrate before God and the priests were unprepared. They had not ceremonially purified themselves. And so King Hezekiah, he prays to God because the priests were not ready. And King Hezekiah asked God, to overlook it 
May the Lord, this is Second Chronicles 30, verse 18. May the Lord, who is good, pardon everyone who sets his heart on seeking God, the Lord, the God of his fathers, even if he is not clean according to the rules of the sanctuary. And the Lord heard Hezekiah and healed the people. The principle being, because God looks upon the heart, there are times because of the situation where God makes allowances. Is that what happens in a local church? My own conviction is that I, I, I fear that I've really seriously begun to wrestle with these issues too late. Um, and that's a confession. I think that in terms of dealing with these things, it's going to be like, you know, the big oil tankers, how slowly... Mm -hmm. these big oil tankers take to turn. I think that we have to start where we are. If you look at Ezra chapter 10 and Nehemiah chapter 13 and some of the issues that they had get into in regarding to marrying foreign women and some of the steps that they had to take were really difficult. If you tried to do that today, you'd probably get the jail. But the fact is we have to start where we are and we have to face up to these, no matter how costly and painful and difficult it may be. Is this a hill that I'm willing to die on? I don't think so. But that doesn't mean it's not important, because like a lot of the other issues that we've talked about, the deeper issue is how we're handling the Scriptures. And as you were saying, Tom, really, the inconsistency of how we're applying it. You know, and some of the the really fanciful theories that you've just given some examples of, of how we want to work these things out and keep everybody happy. I think we've got to just not make the scriptures more complicated than they are and maybe be reading things into them that we wish were there. I think ultimately the scriptures are clear and consistent. And so I would rather come to the conclusion that I'm coming on and the basis of what the scriptures say if for no other reason, so that I do not become part of the drift that I do think that Justin Peters has rightly highlighted. And so let me leave you with four words. Identification. I think we need to own up to where we are. Instruction. Seriously and maturely look at the Scriptures and let the Scriptures speak for themselves. I think we have to confess where we've got it wrong, where we haven't taken it, like in my own case, as seriously as I should have, and then correction. I think we've just got to start where we are and try and address these things and, and put them right. I've written this in my notes. We need to maintain the churches and the biblical distinctives, not reflect the world's standards. In regard to everything I've said today, my name is Stuart Reynolds, and I have my wife's permission to see everything I have today. I dare you to keep that in. And we'll see. It'll be a test of who's listened all the way to the end. Thank you so much for sticking with us. Would uh, love to hear your take on it. If you've come from a different uh, standpoint or just feel like Scripture lands in a different place, it genuinely be, would be really interested to hear from you. Please do let us know. You can leave a comment on our YouTube page if you're watching it uh, slash listening to it there or uh, you can leave a message on RTN, or you can send us an email to info at gnba.net, info at gnba.net. And I hope that you will join us next month for our last episode of First Friday. And as I said at the start, do send your messages, uh, questions or comments to that same email address. Myself and Stuart plan to be back next month. It'll probably be on the first Friday of December, I imagine. Thanks so much for joining us. Goodbye and God bless.